What are you listening for when you're listening as the speakers change? Essentially, it, it really is, it's timbre. I mean, other than obviously we want even frequency response. I, I require my speakers all to have a pretty even impedance. These are, this is not things that I'm listening for. Um, once those things are kind of established, then I am listening for timbre of real instruments. So that the timbre has to be accurate if, to my ear. The, we, as I was sort of describing the way the detail needs to relate to, uh, to what's causing the detail. So detail is essentially information. If that information is free floating, it's not working. The information has to be related to the instrument that's generating it or to the, the ambience that's captured in the recording. So it's getting all of that to sort of gel and it's, you know, it's a kind of a hard thing to describe, but it's, it's very, very specifically one of the things that I'm listening for over the design process. And then beyond that, it's like, I have to be able to enjoy it. You know, I have to be able to play all of my favorite records and not, it, it can't, I don't want, I'd never want any of my designs to cater to one thing. So I need to be able to play all of my favorite chamber music. I need to be able to play all of my favorite funk or reggae, all of my favorite jazz or ambient records. And I, if, if any of those records that I'm playing, if any of them are just like, wow, oh, that's not really a great match for these speakers, that means I'm not done. I can't, I, you know, again, that's another reason why it takes so long for these things to come to market. Because what I have to do, let's say that I have a, a prototype and it sounds it sounds 100% on rock, jazz, classical, electronica, and then I play it on a chamber, uh, I, let's say I play it on a string quartet, and it's not 100%, it's like 70%. It's not done. And that means that I can't, I don't, I can't lose any of the percentage on those other things. So I can't, you know, so I have to be very, very careful with the changes. I have to figure out, I have to analyze, maybe with measurements, certainly with a lot of listening, but I'm going to have to analyze and figure out why it's not working with chamber music and working with all those other things. And then bring the chamber music part of it back up. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. A lot but of I love it, fortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, I often wonder when people... Uh, when reviewers or editors or somebody says that speaker is too colored, what do they mean by coloration? That term now is talking about two different things. There's one thing where somebody is saying these speakers are too colored. I think that they are, and I think what they're referring to is the fact that a certain speaker, and, and I'm not going to name any names, but certain speakers make all recordings or all uh, gear that you're using it with have a similar kind of sound. So that, that means that that speaker is imparting its tonality or whatever its priorities are, it's imparting it on everything that passes through it. So that means all your music is gonna have a, a really warm amber tone or all of it is gonna be lean and mean and very dynamically uh, impressive. You know, and that is, that is the speaker itself is imparting a coloration onto everything. The other definition of color in, in hi-fi speak can be like saturated colors. And, and that is a term in photography where the colors of the items, so you're taking, you, you snap a picture and you've got leaves and you've got uh, a cat and you've got mahogany and you want those, the colors of those objects in that photograph to be saturated. You want those colors to be vibrant. You want them to have the, the color that your naked eye sees when they look at those colors. If those colors are desaturated, it means you're, you're pushing them towards a black and white image. You're, re you're reducing the level of the color in that, that image. And so if you apply that to hi-fi, you're talking about, uh, you're really talking about timbre and you're talking about the, the, the way that those instruments sound to the human ear in that room. So if we go back, let's just go back to a cello, right? The, 
the cello has all those elements. It has the uh, a resonant woodiness. It has the you know the vibrations of strings. It has that abrasion of the rosined horsehair of the bow across the strings, and then it has the sort of ambient quality of the way it's projecting out into a room and the way that that room is interacting with it. So all of those elements together form the puzzle that is the the color of that speaker. And so you want that to, to come through. So a speaker that is itself, let's say, uncolored, meaning it will allow the colors of all those recordings to come through unhindered. And be more transparent. Yeah. Essentially, it makes it transparent to the colors of the recordings. And so this, this recording of cello is going to sound different from that recording of cello through a transparent speaker. And so it's, it's one of the reasons that, that the, the terms used in describing hi-fi are kind of imprecise. And some of those terms, like color, have been used in too many different ways and you have to be very, very careful not to transpose those meanings because then you, it messes everything up. I've never heard music sound like it does with Shindo and Devore. You know, is the Shindo colored? Yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful sound. The Shindo being colored thing is a bit of a myth and it, and it relates back to the way that the speaker is interacting with the amplifier. So if you throw a Shindo amplifier on a, on a speaker that is a, a really inappropriate load, again, maybe uh, a, a super reactive uh, impedance load or something like that that's very difficult, the Shindo amplifiers aren't designed, you know, uh, the, you know the, the founder of the company, Ken Shindo, had no interest in designing amplifiers for speakers like that. And so it, it you know, for people who have only ever heard Shindo gear on speakers like that, you know they they have the wrong impression essentially they have the wrong impression of of what it sounds like and right. and they for them in their experience accurately it is very colored but but if you put it on the right speakers you know the transparency level increases on that kind of thing. who is the customer in mind for these two new speakers smaller listeners uh smaller listening space and or smaller budget absolutely you know i i, I have I always, you know, since I've started the company, I've always had people asking if I was ever going to make a less expensive XYZ. Um, you know, my speakers, because of how we make them and because of the numbers that we build them in, our, my speakers are always going to be expensive in the marketplace. They always are. Even these are, are really expensive. You know, I would never, ever say that a, a speaker that costs $3,900 is a cheap speaker. It's cheap for how we can build, uh, and we've done everything we can to make it as inexpensive as possible. But yeah, so it's it's for the kind of person who has heard our designs in the past and knew that they would never be able to afford a pair of 93s. This, you know, maybe they'll be able to afford this. this that's less than half of the price of a pair of 093s and has a lot of its uh, flavor in it. So yeah, it's it's for those, for those people, sure. Are, are those, having the uh, micros on the third shelf, is that the ideal spot? Do you want the tweeter, tweeter sort of at ear level? Yeah, lower. It, they're designed, like all the orangutans, they're designed to be below your your ear height. Why so, is that? I've never thought about that. Yeah, yeah, all the orangs for the O96s. Uh, basically, when you're sitting down listening to them, actually these, these, the O93s and the O96s, the top of the cabinet is all the exact same height. Huh. They all, they're all, they all have a similar, uh, essentially, the listening axis is is designed into the speaker, and it's called it's it's the polar tilt, and that's done with with drivers, driver design, driver placement, and crossover design. And the polar tilt of all the orangutans is slightly upwards. So when you're sitting down in your listening spot, you want to be able to see the top of the cabinets uh, of your speakers. You want to be able to sit down and be, clearly see the top of your O96s. And that means that your ears are above the tweeter and that means that they're they're proper. If you're super slouched down or you're like on a cushion or a beanbag chair and you're down below so that you're at tweeter level, the speakers are literally, they're not gonna measure or sound as good as they will when you're up above the 
the drivers. Why did you want the tweeters slightly below ear level? Well, the the other way of doing it would have been I would have had to make the, spe the speakers taller and bigger, uh -huh. you know, imposing. Uh -huh. So, you know, that that way I get an, a, an attractive speaker package that looks good in a room, uh, not overwhelming, and um, but but still has, you know, people, the first time they sit down in front of a pair of orangutans, 99% of the time, the first thing people say is, oh my God, the image is way up there, <laughs> right? Nobody expects it because the speakers are low, but it's just, it, you know, the polar tilt is designed to reach your ear at, at that higher height. That, that, mm -hmm. That's all it is. What is the Dor Devor Fidelity trademark speaker sound? Well, well, we've been talking about this whole time, basically, you know, accurate. Uh, well, all right, let's say, let's say the trademark sound is my taste. Literally, that's what it is, right? Uh, you know, because as we were talking before, the speakers have to work with all of my favorite music in all the genres that I want it to, you know, all the genres, period. And it has to work with all the amplifiers that I use, that are in my in my rotation, and they're again I might as well just say it they're my favorite amplifiers. So it just has to work with all that stuff. So that literally makes the speakers my taste. It's it's my preference. My preference is accurate timbre, as we were talking about, uh, transparency to the source. So I have to, I want to make sure that that all of the different recordings that I know really well have their unique sounds. I don't want any of the recordings to become homogenized by passing through my speakers. And um, and yeah, uh, and, and to some extent, greater or lesser, depending on the, on the speakers that we're talking about, uh, room friendliness. I want them to be able to, to be placed in normal rooms. I don't want people to have to have a crazy uh, dedicated listening room with with acoustic treatments all over the place, I want them to work in a in a relatively balanced and normal room. Um, can you say what those amps are you use to uh, gauge your speaker sound? So they're they're amps from from all the different uh, different types of technologies. So I have single ended and push pull, high power and low power, and solid state and tube. For solid state, we have single ended. We have my Pass Aleph Three. It's also low powered. For high powered, we have my uh, Parasound JC Five, which is a big high power push pull. I also have some uh, di some Class D high powered amps. I do have a few more. I have some hybrid integrated amps and stuff like that that, that get put in there. They also get, fall under the solid state banner. And then for tubes, I have for single ended, I have some 300 Bs and single ended 845s. And I even have some single ended 45 amps for very, very low power. Uh, and I have push pull amplifiers that are both low power and high power. So for high power, I have an Audio Research VT130 SE, big push-pull uh, 6550C amplifier that I've had for a very long time, I love. Uh, low power push-pull, I have a, a, a Musical Fidelity RM10. It's, uh, I actually have several different amps that are low power, but they're with EL84, single pair EL84 amps. The single-ended amps I have are Camaro amps and airtight amplifiers for the various single-ended amps. So yeah, all of those amps get put into the rotation um, and to listen. And you know, not all of my amplifiers will sound good with the really low-powered, sorry, not all of my speakers will work with the really low-powered amplifiers. So for example, the a single-ended 300B or especially the single-ended 45 amp it's not going to work great with the with the micro. It's just not enough uh, sensitivity for for something like that. Some people in a really close situation may find that a single 300B is going to still work beautifully with it, and it does. It sounds beautiful, but you don't get a lot of volume out of it. And so, you know, not every speaker is going to work with every amplifier here. Do you have a go-to preamp? I use the same preamp for everything. Right which is currently my, uh, it's an EMT JPA 66 Mark II, <laughs> handful. And you're using its phono stage as well? I use it everything, yeah, phono stage and line stage. It's balanced and single-ended, so it works with all the amplifiers I have here. 
and it's it's my dream preamp. I, I, think I it's love everybody's it. dream. Yeah, preamp. I absolutely love it. Since I got it, it was a it was a barter I did several years ago, and uh, it was an amp. That, it was a preamp that I never thought I would be able to own, but yeah, I love absolutely love it. And you have a, a Gerard Gerard three hundred one and four hundred one. Four hundred one. And what yep. what are the arms? Currently on there is I have a a pretty old now SME four five I, which was a hot rod version of the SME five from the nineties. Uh, uh, I have an Ortofon RF three hundred nine, which I use for. Uh, mono cartridges that's set up for G shells right now and then I have an EMT 997 which is set up for A mount shells and I have currently that's set up for my 78 cartridges. At the present moment what's your cartridge for playing LPs? The stereo cartridge is a uh, Koetsu Coral Stone Platinum. Well thank you so much John DeVore that was going to school today. <laughs> Thanks a lot Kent it was it was awesome to have you here. Far out.